Hello and welcome to Sunday Worship. And I know this is not as you would expect it. Uh, this was not recorded in church. We had a technical issue with our recording this morning and it didn't come out. So I'm preaching the message again for the benefit of those of you who follow online. And we're starting a new series this week. We're looking at Psalm 23. But before we come to Psalm 23, let's read a passage uh, from the book of Jeremiah. And I think you'll see when I read it why. Uh, Jeremiah 23 verses 1 to 8. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people, you have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for your evil deeds, declares the Lord. Then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will set shepherds over them who will care for them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed. Neither shall any be missing, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when they shall no longer say, as the Lord lives, who brought up the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives, who brought up and led the offspring of the house of Israel out of the north country and out of all the countries where he had driven them, then they shall dwell in their own land. Now, I read that for background because it is so uh, important and we'll come back to that. But if you've got a Bible, I'd like you to have it open at Psalm 23. Normally during the uh, summer weeks when people are coming and going with holidays, uh, I preach on something different. Uh, two years ago, I preached on the Lord's Prayer. Last year, we preached on, I preached on some Psalms of experience. So we explored the different dimensions of the Christian life um, and the kind of experiences that we live through. Uh, this year, I want to focus in on just one Psalm and it is everybody's favorite Psalm, Psalm 23. And we're going to really go through this in detail. Today, we're simply going to dwell on the opening verse. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And we're going to meditate on those words and five particular things that they have to say to us. The other thing I want to say before we get into it is that this is a psalm of David. It is a royal psalm written by King David. We don't know whether he wrote it when he was king or when he was living as an outlaw before he came to the throne, uh, but it certainly speaks to his experience as an individual. But because it's a royal psalm, it also speaks for Israel as a whole. There is a sense in which what happens to David as Israel's representative also is the experience of the whole nation of Israel. And the experience of David prefigures the experience of Jesus. So all the twists and turns of this psalm are also the journey that Jesus goes on in his earthly life and death and resurrection. And we'll see that as we come to the subsequent verses. So we're going to read this psalm, if you like, at several levels, the level of David, the level of the people of Israel and the experience of Jesus and our own experience as those who follow him as the disciples of Jesus. Now, there are five things that the uh, verse one has to teach us. And the first of those is the Lord as our shepherd. This idea of shepherd. If, if you were David, try and put yourself in that situation. You were David and you were sitting down to write this psalm. What picture, what metaphor would you use to describe God? Maybe you'd think of God as a king ruling over his people, uh, protecting his people by his power and defeating his enemies and the enemies of his people. Or maybe you think of God as a rich father, a rich parent who is generous and, and lavishes gifts on his children. Or maybe you think of God as a, a righteous judge, uh, that he hears the cries of his people and uh, he answers their prayers and he brings justice for those who cry out for justice. That's a big theme in the book of Psalms, but that's not the metaphor that 
that David chooses here. He chooses the metaphor of a shepherd caring for his flock. Now, of course, David was a shepherd caring for his flock, as uh, Psalm 78 makes very clear. And we know that from the day that he was anointed to be the future king, he was taken from among the flock um, to care for his people Israel. The same was true of Moses before him, that God chose a leader who had learnt his craft as a leader through shepherding a flock. So shepherding has a lot to teach us. Um, about the role of Christian leadership and pastoral care. In fact, the word pastor comes from the word shepherd. But the idea of the Lord as our shepherd, well, that's a, a bigger idea, and it goes right the way back to the book of Genesis. If you turn back to Genesis 48, verses 15 and 16, you find a situation where Joseph has been ruling in Egypt, and now Jacob and his sons have come down to Egypt to find him and, and, and find food, and Joseph brings his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, to his father Jacob in his old age and says, please, will you bless them? And as he does so, this is how Jacob describes God. He, he blesses them in the name of the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil. In other words, as he looked back on his life, all the twists and turns that he had travelled through, the kind of stories that we've been looking at in our home groups on a Tuesday evening, he could see God shepherding him through all his troubles. And he could see God moulding his character, shaping his character. Only God could have provided for him through all his troubles and guided him through all those twists and turns. And what God was for Jacob, he was for the nation that came from him. Jacob was also called Israel, and the nation of Israel were his descendants. His 12 sons formed the 12 tribes, and from them came the whole nation of Israel. All the way along, they have this very intimate and caring relationship with God. It's a very warm description of what God does. God is not far off and uncaring and unfeeling. Quite the opposite. In Isaiah 40 verse 11, I love these words, uh, we hear them sung every Christmas in, the, in Handel's Messiah. These words from Isaiah 40 11, he describes God in this way, he will tend his flock like a shepherd, he will gather the lambs in his arms, he will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. Now that is the tender care of a shepherd for his sheep. And that's the tender care that God has for his people, whoever they may be, from whatever nation they have come from. He cares for all those who trust in him. He protects, he provides, he leads and guides, he feeds, he watches over our going out and our coming in, as the psalm writer puts it in Psalm 121. So that's the first, the first thing, the Lord as our shepherd. What does it mean for him to be our shepherd? The Lord is caring for us and watching over us and keeping us in all our ways. The second thing I want you to notice in this opening verse is the lordship of the shepherd. The lordship of the shepherd. Notice how this opening phrase of the psalm begins. This is where David starts. The Lord is my shepherd. Now that is an affirmation of faith. He is saying very boldly as he starts this psalm, he's not crying out in trouble, he's not um, expressing his doubts and his laments, he is affirming very powerfully, the Lord is my shepherd. My life, says David, and, and Israel's life as a nation is in the hands of the Lord. And God has been shaping David to be the king that Israel needs and the king that God wants him to be. David's life was not his own. He was a king after God's own heart and his life was surrendered to God and the Lord was in charge of it. But not as a tyrant or a manipulator or an abuser. No, the, the Lord is my shepherd, says David. And that word Lord is in capital letters. It's the divine name Yahweh, the I am. Uh, he is the God who keeps his covenant promises. He is the God who never gives up on us. Uh, he is the God who is guided by a divine wisdom. 
And that wisdom is always working out his plans and his purposes in history. He is the one who shepherds us by his wisdom, according to his kindness and his faithfulness. So if we're going to know this God, we need to surrender to him as the Lord of our lives. We cannot just say, yes, you can be Lord of my Sundays. You can be Lord of the, my private devotions at home when I read my Bible and pray. You can be Lord of the spiritual part of my life. He must be in charge of all of us, not just the convenient parts. I was listening to a podcast. Many people have been listening to the podcast, The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill, which is looking at the, the downfall of uh, many of the American megachurches and particularly the Mars Hill Church in Seattle, in Washington. Um, and it's quite a difficult podcast to listen to because some of it's quite grueling. Um, but near the end, they've added some bonus episodes. And one of those I heard this week was a wonderful interview with Tim Keller. Uh, before his cancer worsened recently. He was interviewed back in May. Um, and in that podcast, it's really worth getting to hear it. Um, but he told me about a religion that I have never heard of before. Uh, the religion is called Sheilaism. Now, this goes back to a book that was published way back in 1985 by a group of sociologists called Habits of the Heart. They were surveying, among other things, the religious habits of American society. And so they'd done a lot of social analysis, a lot of surveys and interviews and, and so on and so forth. And one of the things that they noticed was that back in the days of the founding fathers in the uh, 16th and 17th centuries, in the early days, and when America first became independent, religion was a very public thing. Uh, you are either an Anglican or a Catholic or a Baptist or a Congregationalist or a Presbyterian, and, and you knew which denomination you belonged to. Uh, they taught their doctrine very clearly. Many of them had a confession of faith, and you stuck by that confession of faith. You, you signed up to follow, and you, you went along with what your church denomination believed. But now they say, they're writing in the late 20th century, what was true then is even more true now, now they say we are living in the age of individualism and they they did an interview with a young nurse now they changed her name they called her sheila larson but this is what she actually said she said i believe in god i'm not a religious fanatic i can't remember the last time i went to church my faith has carried me a long way it is sheilaism just my own little voice it's just try to love yourself and be gentle with yourself. And, you know, I guess take care of each other as well. In other words, God was not the shepherd of her life. The person who shepherded her life was Sheila by her own inner voice. She worshipped her own inner voice and she followed what that voice said. And when we turn away from God and we turn in on ourselves, that is an act of idolatry. That is saying, you know, I am more important than God and I will listen to this inner voice. Now, I'm convinced that there are thousands of people here living in Didcot for whom that is true. That is so typical of Western culture, isn't it? People who will try to be good to themselves, who will try and follow their own inner voice, but they will never surrender to God. But the starting point of Psalm 23 is the complete opposite. It starts by saying, the Lord is my shepherd. If I'm going to be shepherded by God, it must be as my Lord. We have to admit that the one who is to be the shepherd of our lives can and must be our Lord first and foremost. Now, the third thing is to ask the question, what about the evil shepherds? Maybe some of you are listening to this and you're thinking, yeah, it's all very well talking about the Lord as our shepherd, but my experience of shepherding has been terrible, you say. Maybe the whole idea of authority uh, and leadership is, is a huge problem for you. You've seen ab abusive leadership at work or in your family, um, in your relationship with your own parents, perhaps, um, or relationship with your partner or husband or wife or what have you and and it's been it's been grim frankly they have been abusive in their leadership of you 
Um, maybe in your school days, you went to a school that was excessive in its punishment of children. Or sadly, maybe your experience of abuse has been in a church. And you're only watching this on video because you don't want to go near a church. Well, I want to talk about another rise and fall, actually. Um, I've been reading in the last few weeks a book called The Rise and Fall of Christian Ireland by uh, an academic from Belfast, a church historian called Crawford Gribben. A superb piece of work tracing the history of Christianity in Ireland from St. Patrick and St. Columba, uh, right the way through the Reformation and the Evangelical Revivals, through to the Troubles of Northern Ireland. And at the end of the book, he comes to the saddest part of the story. Child abuse scandals have destroyed much of the witness of the Roman Catholic Church in Ireland. Uh, in the noughties, the, in about 2005, thereabouts, um, a number of child abuse scandals were exposed. A number of bishops were exposed, not only of having been abusers, but others of you know, preaching uh, sexual chastity outside of marriage. And then, although they themselves are not married, having their own mistress and even raising children with her. And it was a huge scandal as their hypocrisy was exposed. Uh, in 1972, I find this statistic hard to credit. In 1972, weekly attendance at church in the Irish Republic was 91%. I don't know anywhere in the world where it's been that high, but that fell to 30% in 2011. So what's that, uh, 30 years later? 40 years later, I would be fascinated to know how low it is now. And before we crow about what's going on in Ireland, we ought to look at our own country and we ought to recognise that here in England uh, there have been abuse scandals. Uh, some of those have rocked Church of England parishes um, that have been caught up in their camps networks where there have been all sorts of going on, goings on. These are in gospel churches where there's a toxic leadership culture and a whole mix of factors that cause all sorts of wrong things to go on. And we should not pretend that that's an Anglican problem only. I'm sure that's a problem in many churches, but because Baptist churches are independent, often it doesn't get found. It is a real concern. There is hypocrisy and there is abuse. And God has a lot to say about that. How does the Bible answer that issue? Our holy divine shepherd, has spoken to those who are his under shepherds and he has had a lot to say. He has seen how because of their position they will damage others and he has seen the damage that they will do. I've just read Jeremiah 23. Let me remind you of some of the words of Jesus as he condemns the bad shepherds of Israel. He says, you have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for your evil deeds, declares the Lord. Then I will gather the remnant of my flock. He's being very, very frank and direct about this. He goes further in Ezekiel chapter 34. Uh, he deals with the shepherds who feed themselves, but do not feed the flock, who are only in it for what they themselves can get out of it. Uh, Ezekiel 34 verse 4 he says the weak you have not strengthened the sick you have not healed the injured you have not bound up the strayed you have not brought back the lost you have not sought and with force and harshness you have ruled them so God declares himself to be against the evil shepherds and he will hold them to account and all those of us who are in pastoral ministry take that very seriously. One day we will have to account for our ministries. And when things go wrong, we search our hearts. We wonder sometimes whether all the work we've done will just burn up in that day. And it will be like we ourselves are the only ones to escape through the flames. There was nothing real that was there. But God also has an answer for Ezekiel in, uh, Ezekiel, uh, in Ezekiel 34. He says in verse 15 and 16, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost 
and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. That's what he has done in our Lord Jesus Christ, who came to bring in a kingdom of righteousness and justice. As we saw when we looked at uh, John 10 in October last year, Jesus says in John 10, I am the good shepherd. And he's saying that in contrast to the bad shepherds of Jeremiah uh, and Ezekiel. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. We must never put our confidence in merely human shepherds. All our confidence. We must never invest all our confidence in, in one man, one spiritual leader. Our focus must be Jesus, for only he is the good shepherd. Only the man who is God, who is perfectly holy and righteous, who is just in everything that he does, can ever satisfy the longing of our souls. When it comes to finding a spiritual shepherd, there is only one place we can go. And that is to say with David, the Lord is my shepherd. Now, the fourth thing I want to say is to focus in on that word, my, the Lord is my shepherd, because this is a very personal confession of faith. We don't just say you are the Lord. You know, we believe that you are the Lord out there, over there, away from us, distant from us. We don't just admire God from a distance. No, we are saying the Lord is my shepherd. To have God as your shepherd is to come into a personal relationship with him. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. John chapter 10 verse 27. How do we come to know God as our shepherd? Well, we need to listen to him. And we listen to him, not through that inner Sheila voice, but through his word. For everything that he has spoken through his word ultimately finds its destination in Jesus and leads us to God, the God that has revealed himself in Jesus. In Israel, God had spoken through Moses. Therefore, if David is going to know the Lord, he's going to have to know the Lord who revealed himself through Moses. He spoke in the days of David and uh, others who wrote the, uh, the books of wisdom, uh, Solomon, his son, and the Proverbs, and the, the book of Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon, and the book of Job. All of those books are, are written out of the age of wisdom in which David lived. He spoke through the prophets who pointed us to Jesus, who preached to Israel's sins, but also pointed us forwards to Jesus. And God has spoken in these last days through his son, our Lord Jesus. And the apostles have written down the words of Jesus so that we have them to draw on in the gospels. And they have also written down the doctrine in the letters that we are working our way through in the New Testament. Every way we turn in scripture, we meet our shepherd, our Lord Jesus Christ, and we meet the wisdom that he is to guide us with and guard us with. God's word written is how he speaks to us, and that is how we must listen to his voice. If this idea of God shepherding your life is a bit alien to you, then I want to ask you the question, have you listened to God's voice through his word? Are you just receiving a sort of mystical understanding of God, or are you going to the Bible to get God's word into your life. Your life, indeed your eternal life, depends on what is written in God's word. We must hear his voice speaking to us through his word written. And when he calls us, we must respond. Those who hear the voice of the shepherd through his word respond in faith. We follow him. We trust in him. And if that all sounds a bit intellectual and tidy and organised, please understand the reality is very, very different. You know, we come to Jesus as our good shepherd in all our brokenness and our muddle and our darkness, in all our need, in all our weakness. We hardly know where to start and we have to ask him for strength to enable us to believe, to enable us to turn from our past in repentance, to ask for his forgiveness as his gift and to find the new life that only he can give. Only the good shepherd can atone for our sin because Jesus himself said, 
the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So when we come and trust in Jesus as our saviour and our Lord, we can say with joy and thanksgiving, the Lord is my shepherd. And we can say it with joy and assurance. Not every Christian feels that every day. We don't have that experience of assurance every, every day, but it is our right if we are trusting in Jesus uh, to know that assurance. Not only to know Jesus, but to know that we know him and to be able to affirm publicly, the Lord is my shepherd. We won't always have that certainty in our lives, but the times when we feel that certainty are the most blissful and the most wonderful. And that brings me to the final thing. David says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. If the Lord is my shepherd, then I shall not want. And that little phrase can be taken at several levels. First, it is a response of wonder. If this great Lord is my personal shepherd, leading and guiding my life and providing me with all I need in Jesus, then my response to him can only be this, I shall not want. How could we ever want more than we have in God? How could we look for anything more? We are delighted in him. He satisfies the longing of our souls. Nothing else will, will ever bring us closer. Uh, nothing else will ever give us any greater joy than what we find in knowing God through his son, Jesus, the good shepherd. We have found our joy in him and it eclipses all our other joys. It is greater than any summer music festival. It's greater than any FA Cup final. It's greater than any sporting achievement. It's greater than all the joys and experiences that life and love can bring us. So much that we long for in this life can only be met and only be satisfied by finding Jesus to be the good shepherd. And when we find him, we say, now I've found him, I shall not want. David is, is expressing his peace here and he's expressing his contentment. Now, he knows that life may hold many troubles for him. It certainly did. And he may be writing this before some of those troubles hit him in a big way. Um, there's all sorts of fears and uncertainties. Um, there's so much that could be snatched away from him. But this cannot be taken away. The Lord is my shepherd. Therefore, whatever happens to me in life, I shall not want. You see, it's very important to take that phrase, I shall not want, and, and not to read it as a, a sort of prosperity goodie bag. It doesn't say, if the Lord is my shepherd, then I will only have good things happen to me. Life will be a bed of roses. He is not saying that. Sometimes life will be very bitter and it can contain some powerful shocks. We do not know what tomorrow is going to bring, do we? I don't know what my future holds, how long my life will last, what's left of it. But we do know that God will shepherd us through the dangers. He can take away our fear and give us a peace in Christ that passes all understanding. I want to finish by telling a story I told a couple of years ago when we were looking at Ecclesiastes, the story of Reed and Kyra Carr. Reed and Kyra were missionaries together, American missionaries in Rome, working with the uh, uh, Cesia Breccia de Roma, the uh, evangelical church in the heart of the city of Rome, where some of our friends are working, they're working with them. Um, and they had got to the summer in 2015 and they went back to America to visit their supporting churches and to see their families. Um, and it was just before they were due to fly back that they went out for a meal with uh, one of their sets of parents. I'm not sure which ones it was. And um, on the way home from the restaurant, uh, they were in the car with two of their children. Uh, behind them in another car were, were the, the grandparents with one of their granddaughters. And there was a truck driver who had parked his truck, truck up a side road, up a hill, and he parked up and jumped out to go and attend to something on the back of the truck. What he didn't realize was he hadn't applied the air brake. And the truck started to roll away just as soon as he jumped out of it and he couldn't catch up with it and, 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 and stop it. And the truck came piling down the hill as they were driving along the road and the truck 
piled into the side of their car, T-boned the car, and Kyra was killed immediately. The two children in the back were injured. Um, Reed was had a few minor injuries uh, and had they took two hours to cut them out of the car. So there he was having to organize his wife's funeral, he and his three daughters, after three months of, of shock and grief, uh, they decided to go back to Rome. And he wrote these words on the Desiring God website. By no means does faith in Christ guarantee a life free of hardship and suffering. It is in fact the opposite. Suffering is not an exception for the believer, but the norm. The Apostle Paul warns his disciple that all who desire to live a godly life in Christ will experience suffering, 2 Timothy 3. Trials are to be expected. The hope of the gospel, however, is that, in, is that life in Christ frees us from the fear that suffering and trials produce. Whereas sin enslaves us to fear, the gospel frees us from fear and enslaves us to grace. The Apostle Peter states very clearly, 1 Peter 5, verse 10, After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen and establish you. That has been Reed's experience these past seven years. With the Lord as his shepherd, he has not wanted for God's care and grace. And that can be your experience and mine as well, that whatever life brings us, we are in the care of the Good Shepherd and therefore we shall not want. May God bless his word to you wherever you are today.